Hi everybody, it's your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we're continuing Unit 7 on Natural Selection by diving into Topic 7.9, which is on phylogeny. And this is a new topic that we have not quite yet discussed. Um, so far we've talked about, you know, natural selection, why organisms evolve, the fact that organisms do evolve, um, and we've gotten into a little bit of math, how we know that they change over time, uh, we talked about a lot of the different forms of evidence that shows that, yes, evolution is actually a thing and species come from other species. Um, and it's the really, evolution, as we've t talked about before, is really the reason for all the diversity and yet the unity of life. Um, and nowhere is that more clearer when we study phylogeny. Um, and phylogeny is studying the evolutionary history of a species or a group of species. Um, and what you're going to see a lot of when it comes to phylogeny are phylogenetic trees, which are bi branching diagrams representing hypotheses about evolutionary relationships. Okay, so what we're looking at today and when we study phylogeny is what groups of organisms come from what other groups of organisms and how closely related are two groups of organisms. So um, phylogenetic trees are very similar to family trees, right? You can trace your heritage um, by moving up your family tree, right? Who's clo more closely related to each other? Well, you and your siblings are going to because you share the same mom and mom and dad or like something like that, or at least you share one parent. Um, you and your cousins are less closely related to each other because you don't share parents, but you share a grandparent. And you and your first, I would think that would be second cousins, share like a great grandparent, right? Um, so, and you and your second cousin aren't very closely related. Um, and it's the same kind of idea when we're studying phylogeny. We can figure out which ones, you know, are siblings, which ones are cousins, which ones are second cousins, um, based on evolutionary relationships and, and evidence based in both morphology, which are structures, like what structures do they have in common, um, like physically and molecular evidence, like how much DNA or how many protein sequences do they have in common? Okay, so uh, what we're going to be looking at are the characteristics of a phylogenetic tree like this one, and we're going to be making our own cladogram, which is another type of phylogenetic tree um, based on shared characteristics. All right, so uh, let's get into it. Here's, a, here's an example of a phylogenetic tree of arthropods. Okay, so if you don't know, arthropods are organisms that, you know, breathe through holes in their skin or like holes in their shell. Um, they have chitin-based um, exoskeletons and they have jointed limbs. Um, so those are arthropods. And here's the kind of evolutionary history of arthropods. Okay, so uh, one group of arthropods diverged into two larger groups and those two larger groups diverged into, well, smaller groups, okay? Um, so the first part of the uh, evolutionary tree or a phylogenetic tree that I want us to look at are the branch points. And the branch points are on a tree, they're like branches, right? They, they show the divergence of two evolutionary lineages from a common ancestor. And that point on the, on the tree represents common ancestors of, uh, of two groups. Okay, so uh, take a look at this. I don't know all these different orders here. But uh, what these are, by the way, what these are representing, an arthropod is a, arthropod is a phylum. Uh, these two groups, it looks like Paradoxopoda and Pancrustacea, those are called um, classes. And then the rest of these are, would be orders. So like maybe you learned this in sixth grade, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, right? So these are not species. These are what we call orders or larger groups um, when it comes to classifying living things. Anyway... Uh, the branch points here represent uh, where these two groups um, diverged from each other. It shows their common ancestor. Okay, so uh, right where this dot right here is showing the common ancestor or the point in their evolutionary history where centipedes and millipedes and arachnids diverged from one another. Okay, and by um, putting these together on this phylogenetic tree, we can infer that centipedes and millipedes are more closely related to arachnids than they are to, say, insects. Okay, so that's something that we can, uh, that's a conclusion that we can draw from phylogenetic trees. We can figure out, oh, okay, they share a more recent common ancestor. That means they're probably more closely related, just like your siblings are more closely related to you because you share, like, a mom, mom and or dad, and than your cousins, okay, because you share a grandma with your cousins, but you share a parent with your uh, siblings, right? 
So uh, these, these are like siblings and these are like, you know, kind of distant cousins. Okay, because take a look at this. The most recent common ancestor of say, arachnids and insects is in fact all the way back here, the common ancestor of all arthropods. Okay, so these two diverge from each other very early on in the evolutionary history of arthropods. Okay, so this dot, dot over here, this branch point is representing the common ancestor of all these different groups of arthropods. Okay, same idea over here. This, this branch point represents the common ancestor of the most recent common ancestor of all of these groups and so on and so forth. Okay, um, so it's really just like a family tree, right? Uh, so another term I'm going to introduce to you are six sister taxa, groups of organisms that share an immediate common ancestor or closest relatives, like these, these are like siblings on your phy, uh, phylogenetic tree, okay? Uh, so if you can find siblings on here or sister taxa on here, check it out. It looks like Remipedia and Columbola. I'm not really sure what those are, I'll be honest with you. Um, but those look like to sister taxa because they ver share a very recent common ancestor. Same with these three groups. They all share a more recent common ancestor than, say, Cirripedia and uh, I'm Br Branchiopoda, right? They share a more recent common ancestor, and thus they are sister taxa. And a uh, taxa is a fancy word for groups, or a taxon is a fancy word for a group. Um, hence, the basal taxon, a lineage that divides uh, is diverges, that should say, diverges from all other lineages early in the history of the group, right? So there, there wasn't really a good example in this, uh, this diagram that I found on the internet, um, but I drew one in, okay? So like, if there was one other group that diverge and is separated from all the other, uh, all the other groups on this phylogenetic tree, that would be our basal taxon. They share a common ancestor, you know, because they're arthropods, but they are different and they're separated um, evolutionarily from, they diverged evolutionarily from these other two groups, Pancrustacea and Paradoxopoda. Okay? Uh, so, yeah, there you have it. Basal taxon, sister taxa, and branch points. That's really what I want you to know, those terms from phylogenetic trees. Okay, uh, some other important points that I want to make about phylogenetic trees. Okay? Um, family trees and phylogenetic trees that show patterns of descent, not phenotypic similarity. Okay, so two organisms that are close to each other on the tree, maybe they're our sister taxa, they might not look the same, okay? They might not have the same structures. They may, may uh, look completely different from one, from one another, perhaps. Um, so, but they, if they share a very recent common ancestor, then they belong next to each other on uh, a phylogenetic tree. Even though they don't look anything alike, they might belong next to each other based on other similarities that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, phylogenetic trees do not show, typically show absolute age. Um, there are some trees that can include a time component that, is, that gives you a scale of, like, say, 500 million years, then every branch point represents the approximate age at which the common ancestor evolved or, like, these two species diverged. But, um, but they show relative age, okay? So we can say that uh, Amoebozoa is an older group than Dysocia or Tubulinia. Okay, in that they are further away from the original branch point on this diagram. Okay, so they can show relative age. Finally, is that uh, we can't assume a group on a taxon or a phylogenetic tree, phylogenetic tree evolved from the taxon next to it. Okay, we can't say that metazoa evolved from coanoflagellata. Okay, we can't say these two evolved from each other. Okay. Um, just because they're next to each other, we can say evolve, they evolved from a recent common ancestor, though. Okay, that's a, another point that I'm just trying to make here, uh, as to to give us a little guidance in interpreting these phylogenetic trees. Okay, uh, next point um, that we want to talk about: phylogenies, phylog phylogenetic trees, and cladograms are based on morphological and molecular evidence. So let's talk about the morphological evidence. Morphology is basically the way organisms are structured. Um, and the more they have in common, the more structures they have in common, tends to mean that they're more closely related to each other. In 7.6, we looked at examples of homologous structures, the fact that all of our different vertebrates have the same set of bones in their forearm, hum humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges, right? Um, so those are what we call homologous structures, and those they all got those traits, all got those bones from a distant common ancestor. 
right? Um, so morphological evidence and structural evidence like that can give a pretty good indication most of the time of which organism, organisms are related to one another, but it's not always the best, okay? Because sometimes you get something that's not homology, but it's analogy, okay? Sometimes you get analogous structures. And analogy is referring to a similarity between organisms that is due to organisms encountering in similar uh, environmental pressures, okay? And, there's, and when there's not much genetic similarity. A classic example of analogy is between the ichthyosaur and a dolphin. Okay, so this is an ancient reptile. It was around during the dinosaurs. It went extinct. Okay, and it's very aquatic. Take a look. It's got fins. It's, it looks like a dolphin, right? It looks like a, a fish almost, but it's a reptile. Okay, and it evolved these traits based on, well, adapting to uh, this, this group adapting to their environment, right? So they lived in an aquatic environment and then over time evolved these traits to help it survive um, in the, the marine environment. Okay, so did a dolphin. Okay, dolphins have very, very similar traits. Okay, but A, dolphins still exist, and but B, they're mammals. Okay, they're very distant uh, evolutionarily. Well, not very distant, but pretty distant um, evolutionarily from, from reptiles. Okay, so these, uh, the ichthyosaur and the dolphin, they are not cousins. They're not siblings. They're not closely related to one another, but they have very similar characteristics because they, involve, they evolved in the same environment. Okay, they adapted in the same way. That doesn't mean they're closely related. All right, so thus, our more reliable form of evidence and our more accurate form of evidence um, that we use to make phylogenetic trees and infer relationships among organisms, or I should say species, groups of organisms, is based on molecular data. It's much better. Um, and it wasn't always available, say, like in the 18th and 19th century, Darwin and uh, Cuvier and Linnaeus, you know, couldn't classify and uh, draw evolutionary relationships based on, you know, DNA similarities or protein similarities because that technology was not available. Um, so our phylogenetic trees have evolved themselves. They've been revised several times to account for more evidence. Um, so hypotheses, you know, can be rejected or accepted based on, um, based on evidence, based on whether or not they've been tested. So uh, yeah, as we've gotten more information about molecular data, um, we've revised our phylogenetic trees. Okay, so similarities in DNA and protein sequences indicate homology, and we've used that to revise our trees over the past several hundred years. Um, yeah, so this is more accurate. Okay, so something else that we're going to look at, the last thing that we're going to talk about today are cladistics. It's a methodology of classification um, that places groups into species, um, that it, into groups that include an ancestral species and all of its descendants, which are called clades. Uh, so a clade is a group of organisms that includes, you know, a group and then all of its ancestral species. Um, so this, that's something that we're going to take a look at here. We're going to make a cladogram, a very simple cladogram, in just a minute. Uh, so what is a cladogram? It's a phylogeny. It's like a phylogenetic tree that's based on homologous characteristics or what we call characters. All right. And once we walk through our example here, it'll, it'll become more clear. This is not the best example, but it looks like a cladogram. All right, uh, so this is the simplest way to put a cladogram, I think. Um, this is how I learned to make cladograms. And uh, we're going to walk through a very simplistic example. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to put these six organisms onto this diagram, and we're going to show the phylogeny. We're going to show the evolutionary history of, uh, of these organisms, okay, based on these six characteristics or characters. Okay, so we're going to group, put them into groups based on how much they have in common. Okay, how many of these characters that they actually share, okay? Uh, so, like, for example, not all of them have hair. Not all of them have four limbs, right? So the ones that have more in common, we're going to put them closer together. And the ones that have less in common, we're going to put them further apart, okay? So where do you begin with something like this? Well, this up top here is where the, uh, where the organisms are, okay? And then these dashed lines are where we're going to put the characters, okay? So if we follow this tree up from the root, okay, we can, you know, branch off wherever we'd like to. And remember, the branch points are still representing common ancestors, right? But uh, like say, for, for example, if I'm fo following up the tree here, all of these organisms, okay, past this point are going to have that shared character. You'll see what I mean, okay? Um, so where to start when we're making cladogram, I did this one for you, um, is to start with the outgroup. And the outgroup is the group that has diverged before the lineage that includes the species we study. 
Um, and it's basically the group with the least shared characters among your, uh, your list of organisms, okay? All right, and uh, the most different one here, the one with the least shared characteristics, is definitely, definitely a lancelet, okay? If you don't know what a lancelet is, it is a, um, it is a marine invertebrate, okay? It's an invertebrate. It doesn't have a backbone, okay? And frankly, the rest of these organisms on this list, they do have a backbone, Okay, so uh, it has, shares nothing in common. It doesn't have a hair, it doesn't have amnion, it doesn't have hinge jaws, forelimbs, it doesn't have any of that stuff. Okay, uh, so that's going to be our out group. Our next job is to find the next least, the, the next organism that's the least like the others. One of these things is not like the other, right? Um, the next one would be the lamprey. And if you don't know what a lamprey is, it's basically like a, it's a type of fish. Okay, it's got a backbone, but it doesn't have jaws. It's just basically got this like, mean sucker looking thing and they're parasites and it's awful um but anyway yeah lamprey are the next one on our group because they share the least in common with the other ones um besides the lancelet okay so the lamprey has a vertebral column but it doesn't have hair it doesn't have amnion it doesn't have four limbs and just definitely does not have uh jaws okay so the vertebral column uh, here's another term that i'm going to introduce to you it's called the shared ancestral character the character that originated in the ancestor um, in an ancestor of the taxon. Okay, so all the other ones are going to have a vertebral column. That's what makes it a shared ancestral character, besides the lancelet, of course. All right, so let's finish the rest of it. Um, the next one that has the probably fewest characteristics, okay, if you want to solve this yourself, go for it. I'm just going to go ahead and do it, though. Um, so if you want to pause the video and try this yourself, you can. Um, but so here we go. Okay, let's see. Um, out of these four, which one has the fewest char characteristics here? Well, a bass doesn't have hair, doesn't have an amnion, doesn't have four limbs, but it does have hinged jaws. Okay, so we're going to put a bass right there, okay, and has hinged jaws, okay, but it doesn't have all these other things. All right, the next one, probably a frog, okay, a frog has all these things. It um, doesn't have hair, it doesn't have amnion, um, but it does have four limbs, okay? Um, then we got two more on here. Okay, the uh, leopard has both hair and amnion, but the turtle does not have hair. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and put the turtle up there. Um, amnion is, by the way, it's like a fluid that supports a developing young. So like reptiles are able to lay eggs, amniotic eggs that have fluid in them so they can lay them on land. Um, and mammals and birds are also amniotic. Okay, so that means their their young are supported by fluids once and from nutrients um, from the mother while uh while they grow okay so uh they're amniotic okay then finally the leopard is going to go up here and the leopard has hair it is the only one that has hair okay so uh we've completed our cladogram um so there's one more term that i'd like to introduce to you on here it is the shared derived character and on our diagram the shared derived character is hair um in that the leopard is the only one that has hair it is the evolutionary novelty unique to a clade okay um, so yeah, we're going to be getting more practice with this, um, in my class at least. So please let me know if you have any questions about phylogenetic trees or cladograms or whatever else, and we will see you next time. Bye.